Good morning. Today's scripture reading is 2 Kings 5, 8 uh, through 14. When Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him, sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man came to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with the horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash your south seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be clean. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God. Wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abram and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash them in them and be clean? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servant went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean, like that of a young boy. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. You know, sometimes before a uh, sermon starts, you can kind of get an idea of what, what it's going to be about. Um, maybe you saw the, the sermon title and you got something out of that. But I, I will let you know that that sermon title sometimes is just what randomly popped through my mind whenever I'm typing in the bulletin. Like, Unchained Melody is the, uh, <laughs> is the title of today's sermon. And that's because my, I was actually singing Unchained Melody in my head when I was typing the bulletin. It's absolutely nothing to do with the uh, the sermon, so you can't get it off that. But other times, maybe you got to go a little early. You thought, okay, let me look up to the Bible and see see what's in there. So maybe you can read the scripture beforehand and get an idea. Um, sometimes you hear what the lay reader reads, and you're like, okay, I, I know what this uh, topic is going to be. Um, and it gets you to think about it so that you can apply it just for a, a little bit before I preach it. But there are other times that I actually don't want you to know what the sermon is about because I don't want you to know because you might zone out after you figure out what the topic is before I actually get to preach it. You think, well, that certainly doesn't apply to me. Um, I mean, if it's a sermon on wives, husbands might uh, already be inclined to, uh, to zone, or a sermon on husbands, wives might. If it's a sermon on kids, adults might, uh, vice versa with, with the adults. If it's a sermon on patience, you might be like, I'm patient enough already. I know this. I don't have to listen. Can we get this moving on, please? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll preach on that next week. I'm very patient with you. Um, so different people zone for different things. We do. We've all done it. I mean, you know, anytime you're anywhere, you've seen people and you've been people that kind of got that glassy look across your face. You know, your eyes are open, but you are, you're sleeping. You're sleeping with your eyes open. You're zoning. Um, so I was very hesitant to tell you what this sermon was going to be about because I thought, oh, man, they're going to hear it. Then everybody's going to be zoning. There's going to be more people sleeping here than, than sleeping in a nursing home on Thanksgiving after a big meal and they crank the heat. I mean, you people will just be out. Um, so I struggled when I was going to actually let you know the topic, but I thought maybe, maybe if you promise me that you're going to listen, that you're not going to zone, then I'll tell you what it's all. Can you make that promise? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay, well, I'm going to, uh, today I'm going to preach on pride. That's what I'm preaching. Don't give me that hook! I told you, I'm preaching on pride, and I just, I already saw it in your face. You, well, I ain't got no problem with the sin of pride. I can tell you that much. That is for sure. And that is a prideful statement to make, folks. Um, and this is exactly why you need to hear this sermon today. Um, so let me tell you what, what I'm actually talking about, but let's pray for us. Dear God, we, uh, we thank you for today, and we do help, ask for your help, God. God, help us not to zone. Help our minds not to drift. Just stay focused on your word for this short period of time so that we can hear and apply whatever it is you teach us as an individual. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
When we look at today's Bible story, which, thank you very much, Randy. Somehow, Randy always draws a short straw. He gets the hardest names, the hardest places every single time. He never gets to preach on that or read John 3.16 or anything like that. No, it's, it's 2 Kings. Um, so, uh, thank you, Randy. And we hear about this guy. His name is Naaman. And he's a pretty impressive guy. If you actually look back, it describes you why this man is, is so impressive. Naaman is a commander in the, the, the army of Aram which was uh, just to the north of Israel. And he wasn't just any old commander, he was the best of the best. This guy had won a lot of, of battles. He was very good at his job. And because he was such an impressive guy, the king really looked down on him, uh, you know, just, just really uh, proud of who Naaman was. Um, listen how Naaman is described. It says, he was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but... There's always a butt, isn't there? Isn't there always a butt? Like the butt, he had a big nose, but, but his wife was obnoxious. <laughs> that happens. Um, what's a butt this son? Uh, he was a uh, dying soldier, but he had leprosy. Wow, that's a, that's a pretty big butt. <laughs> So this was a uh, this was a pretty remarkable guy. Great at his job, position of authority, favored by the king, but he's got leprosy. Leprosy, a disease that is eventually going to take his life, and there's nothing that they can do about it. Um, uh, the cure for the leprosy wasn't even found until the 1940s. So back in this day, that was a death sentence. They would actually send you away. You weren't allowed to be uh, around anybody else except other lepers in a leper colony, and they'd tell you to go live in a cave. Um, and if you were to come in contact or anywhere near anyone else, if you were walking down the road, you had to shout, unclean, unclean, because people didn't want to pass by you um, because that's how serious this disease was. So Naaman had leprosy. Um, but Naaman walks out because one of his slaves is actually familiar with Israel and tells him there's a prophet in Israel who might be able to help heal his leprosy. So when Naaman hears this, he decides that it's definitely worth a try, and he uh, eventually winds up at the prophet Elisha's door. Now, when Naaman shows up outside of Elisha's door, it's not just like Naaman went for a walk. It is Naaman brought his entire household, his servants, his chariots, all of that, and showed up out of Elisha's door. If you were there, you would have been impressed. And you would have known that this is an important guy who was just pulled in here to, to get, uh, you know, to get something done. Um, and he sends somebody in to tell Elisha that he's here. Um, and Elisha sends somebody out to tell him what to do. Elisha sends a servant out to Naaman to tell him how to, to, to get healed by God. Elisha doesn't even come out of the house himself. And Naaman, he doesn't take too kindly to this. I mean, he's Naaman. You know what I mean? Um, he, he is Naaman. This guy doesn't even bother to come out of his house to talk to him. Who does this guy think he is? Because he is Naaman. Verse 11, Naaman says, I, I thought that he would surely come out to me and, and call on the name of the Lord his God and just wave his hand over the spot and cure me of leprosy. And basically, Naaman throws his hissy fit. He says, he can't do that. I'm I'm Naaman! Doesn't he know that I'm Naaman? And you get a guy here who's reacting out of pride. That, that's what it is. I mean, this, this is what it is. He is reacting out of pride. And he's been offended because he's so important that, that this man should have done it in the way that he feels he deserved to, to have it done. And uh, maybe you're tempted to zone now because you're thinking, Psh, he must be talking about somebody else because... First of all, I never sounded like that. I mean, that is the most nasal man I've ever heard in my life. I've never talked like this ever. So clearly, I do not struggle with pride. It's not, it's not something that I deal with. It's something I battle with. I can tell you about some proudful people, prideful people that I know, but that's not me. I, I, pride isn't something that, that, I, that I go through. And I say, are you sure? Are you sure? Because I, I don't want you to zone out be, 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 before you're sure. Because here's the thing. Pride is one of those sins uh, that kind of hides itself as something else. So if you want to see, if you have it, if you want to see if pride is something that, 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 that is, and sinful pride, sinful pride is something that, that is inside of you, then you can't look for the obvious. You've got to look for the subtle clues to decide. So let me get the hamster wheel spinning in your head so I can show you some of the subtle symptoms of pride. So ask yourself this question if you're trying to figure out whether or not you're, you deal with pride in your own life. And understand, 
it doesn't have to be all of these. It just has to be one or two of these are kind of a sign for you to stop and think, okay, well, well, what's, what's going on that's causing this? Okay, so first of all, ask yourself, do you get easily offended? Do you get easily offended? And do you find yourself to be offended a lot? Because if you're asking the question, how dare they do that to me, that's probably a, a symptom that you have something going on. Do you find it difficult or impossible to apologize when you've done something wrong? Are you able to say, I'm sorry? And are you able to say genuinely, I'm sorry, in, in a way that is meaningful? Or do your apologies sound something like, I am sorry that you made me do that, okay? I am sorry for that. Yeah. That's not a genuine apology in case you were wondering. Do you easily find what is wrong in others' lives? Can you look at the lives around you and just immediately be like, hmm, I'll tell you what's wrong with them? Yeah, can, can you do that? Do you hold on to hurts for an extended period of time? Is that just something that you can't let go of? Do you ever speak out loud about the sins of others in annoyance? Do you talk about those sorts of things because you can't believe the things that other people are doing? Do you work hard at how people see you publicly? That's, that's, that's a really good question because I, I honestly cannot tell you during my life how many times I have said something or done something to my children and then looked around to see if anyone happened to overhear or see what I, had, uh, what I had just done. Do you immediately get defensive if somebody calls uh, something into question? It, it, do you just go immediately on the defensive without being able to listen? Do you refuse to ask for help when needed? Do you talk about yourself a lot? <laughs> that's, the one, see, that's the one that we think about. But there's a whole different uh, arena to it that, that we completely miss. Here's, here's a good one. Do you blow people off when they call or text you? Do you? Do you see it? Do you see that, that, that there's a number on your phone or on your call ID and you're like, yeah, I just don't, don't want to talk to them right now at this moment. I'll get back to it a couple of days from now. I mean, that, that is a, a symptom of pride. Um, do you always say thank you when, when someone does something for you, even if it was part of their job? Do you seldom find yourself complimenting or encouraging others? And seriously, tell me when I give you a list like this and some of those don't apply to you. Go ahead, do it. Tell me that you are the humblest person that you know out of everybody. And there's irony found in that, folks, if you didn't pick that up. What is pride? Pride, simply put, is the opposite of humility. That's what it is. And, and it's, I, I know we have like those far out examples of prideful people, but pride is also something, um, and we're, understand we're speaking of sinful pride here. So we're not saying, you know, just being proud of who God created you to be. It's, it's more than that. It's more than that. Um, it's the opposite of humility. I heard once about a lady who came to her pastor and she asked him a theological question and she said, Pastor, I don't know how I'm going to be able to get my robe uh, over my wings without bending them. And her pastor replied, well, how are you? I wouldn't worry about that. I'd worry about how you're going to get your halo over your horns. <laughs> <laughs> Philippians 2, 3. It says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Here's a kicker, folks. Thinking of others better than yourselves. Thinking of others better, better than yourselves. You understand how, how difficult that command is? That is not an easy command. And, and the scripture is not telling us not to have self-esteem. That's not what it's saying at all. It's not saying don't take pride in who God has created you to be. No, that, that's not what, what it's getting at. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is it's saying don't push uh, the other people's side of the seesaw down so that your side of the seesaw raises up into the air. And, and what I mean by that is, in our lives, we live on a seesaw with us sitting on one end of the seesaw and with everybody else sitting on the other end of the seesaw. And the goal of almost everyone's life in this world is to get themselves raised up. You just want to be that person that everybody looks to and says, wow. Um, so how do we do that? Well, in our minds, the easiest way to do that isn't to, to push our side up, but it's to push their side down. 
So what do we do? We wind up uh, being people who have a goal of getting us elevated, but it's easier to get us elevated by getting them to de-elevate. Um, and we think if we push them down, then we can stay up. And, and it's not even something actively that, that we're trying to do. It's just something that our minds say, okay, get yourself higher. How can you do it? Get them lower. So what do we do? We hold them down by critiquing. We judge. We stick up our noses. We know who we're better than in life. And we make sure that everybody around us knows how awful they are just compared to us. I would never do that. I'm not like that. that that's not me. Um, that, that, that's you. But in reality, what God asks us to do is he, he, he wants a complete opposite to happen. He wants us to hold our side down. He wants us to humble ourselves. He wants us to lower ourselves, to make ourselves a form of a servant so that the other side comes up into the air, so that those people are, are above us, so that they rise above us and we consider them better than ourselves. To, in humility, consider and treat people better than ourselves. And what we don't understand is is that if we would put effort into lifting them up, you know what they would do? They would respond in kind and do the same thing for us, lifting us up so that we didn't have to lift ourselves. And that seesaw could actually work the way that it was meant to work, us helping them get into the air and them helping us get into the air, but instead our pride just pushes their side down so that we can stay up, so that we can stay up. Naaman has good friends. He has some good friends who can make him swallow his pride because otherwise he would have missed an awesome blessing in his life. And that's the same thing that we risk, folks. When all we're staying focused on is, is trying to get ourselves up in the air, we miss what God's got going on around us. But, but Naaman has good friends, and Naaman's getting ready to go back um, to home, not being healed. But one of his servants is like, hey, my, my father, listen, if, uh, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? Okay, then how much more when he just tells you to go wash and be cleansed? He basically says, hey, I know that you were expecting this big, grandiose affair to take place because you're a name, man. I mean, I know that. I know that. But listen, that's not how God planned it. So since we traveled this way, can, can we just go to the Jordan and, and you can wash off to, to see if, if God heals you through that? And Naaman listens. And he swallows his pride. He humbles himself. He lowers himself. And he goes to the Jordan, comes up, and what do they say? His skin is like a new baby boy or something like that. Is that how they it? I mean, he's, he's completely healed, completely restored. And when Naaman finally lets go of his pride, he was able to receive the blessings that God had in store for him. And I'm just wondering what blessings we're missing out because our big, old, inflated heads are getting in the way. Folks, the truth is, I battle pride. You battle pride. We battle pride. We do. Maybe not as bad as some other people, but it's still in our lives. So nobody gets his own on this one. And I'm just, all I'm doing is ending by asking you this today. Let us stop being so easily offended. Okay? Let us stop looking for the bad in others. Let us stop critiquing everyone around us. Let us stop pointing fingers. Let us thank and be grateful to everyone around us for all the big things and the little things that they do. Let us forgive those who have hurt us. Let us admit our own mistakes. Let us let go of our pride. Folks, today let's stop pushing the sea salt down to lift us up. And instead, in humility, let us start placing others above ourselves so that we can get it working again the way that God designed it to be. Is that cool? Alright, let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for today. God, and and uh, I know it's, it's tough to swallow for all of us to, to admit that, that we have elements of pride in us, God. And we ask that you would help us to really look to Jesus, our example, who was the greatest yet most humblest person on the face of the earth. That guy never bragged about himself, not even once, God. To help us to begin to really place the needs of others before ourselves and to lift them up in humility so that they have the opportunity to do the same for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.